along with my education, I, I needed to kind of go back and really dive in into these these histories that weren't told. I, I never knew there was an all Mexican school in Anaheim. Um, and, you know, luckily with uh, the education that I did get, I was able to go into these centers and pretty much demand um, anything that was, uh, any kind of history that was uh, Mexican American, uh, black and indigenous. And I came about, you know, there was, it's, it's an immense collection um, that I think wasn't really well known. And I only really knew about it from, uh, you know, small articles or uh, stories from other families that I met. Um, so again, this is, you know, pretty much a segregated school, right? Oh, Mexican school. Um, you know, and along that, I, you know, I kept just kind of documenting, um, you know, my neighborhood, uh, the everyday things that were happening. Uh, this is titled uh, Car Wash for the Homie. Uh, kind of everyday things that we would see in the neighborhood uh, that, again, were away from this land. You know, this street to the right, you take that up, um, you know, less than a mile and you're in Disneyland. Um, so again, you know, versus joyous versus death, this is kind of like those contradictions that a lot of cities do have. Uh, and we, we're seeing it so much often now, right? Um, yeah, especially with the pandemic, um, you know, two of the cities that were, are being affected so negatively in, in Orange County are, are predominantly Latinx communities, which is Anaheim and Santana. You know, and this was done during uh, my early years of college. Uh, you know, I was always not too far from LA, thinking that I could get some stories in LA instead of uh, my hometown. My professors were like, just look in your backyard. There's stories there to be told. Um, you know, don't forget about the places that you grew up in. Um, and, and thankfully, you know, those uh, stories, uh, that one like final project at, at Cal State Fulton uh, ended up being in a, in a newspaper article um, you know, a couple years after that. So I'm always, you know, thinking about keeping all these images for record. Um, Cause you never know, someone might, you know, reach out and want to share that story. Um, you know, but this is, this is what is kind of more normal for me than, than versus the kind of happiest place on earth. Again, you know, growing up here, I only went to Disneyland for grad night, um, which is, you know, senior year, you go out and kind of like enjoy your last year um, as a teenager or as a high school student. Um, and I only went there because it was actually cheaper than going on a regular day. Um, so, you know, funny story is that my sister did go as a young kid. Um, my parents kept that away from me and my little brother because, again, they couldn't afford to take all, uh, all of us. And I have a phobia of fear of uh, roller coasters and heights. Um, so they knew it was going to be a waste of money if they took me. So, you know, I don't blame them because I think that's, you know, my sister enjoyed it. Um, but then again, that was the huge kind of disconnect that, that a lot of my community had versus the kind of tourist area that we're thinking about. Um, and you know, I think uh, when making work, we're making new work, you know, all these things kind of came up and uh, growing up around a lot of folks that do have tattoos, you know, that aesthetic was something that was um, always something very close to me. And, uh, you know, I somehow ended up finding these uh, quote unquote prison tats from a company that sells um, to supposedly Hollywood film sets. Um, and they had these tabs that were definitely marked and, and kind of put into this kind of stereotypical uh, image of people and mostly uh, in California, mostly uh, kind of stereotyped a lot of black and brown people, um, you know, because these are the tattoos that I did see on people that I knew, you know, not specifically the same one, but the rose, um, uh, you know, some that I also carry myself. Um, and I think, you know, this brought up a lot of uh, a lot of memory for me because I do have, you know, family that are, are incarcerated and are, um, you know, have been incarcerated and then kind of, um, you know, left to kind of fend for themselves. Um, so I decided to kind of do a little bit of, of a playful take on this um, stereotype that, you know, we think tattoos are not um, 
I mean, they're so super common, uh, but there's still these things that you notice in, in media. Um, I mean, I'm thinking of like Shia LaBeouf's recent um, movie, uh, you know, he turns, he doesn't say he's a Chicano or a, or a Latinx folk, but that is that culture that surrounds LA, right? Um, so this is this is was the the kind of end of result of that, and I'm still working on on me work of this um, and finding folks that you know are black and brown and don't usually don't have tattoos, right? You know, these two friends of mine uh, don't have tattoos, um, are not quote unquote like gang affiliated, and so these temporary tattoos have a double. Uh, double symbols, right? These are temporary and then on top of temporary, right? The the tape and, and you know, I could easily make this into um, trying to make these tattoos super realistic on, on the bodies, but I think that was gonna be taken away from that idea that, um, you know, these stereotypes are pretty comedic and, and, and pretty hurtful. And I think, um, you know, seeing this double temporality of uh, of tattoos um, was something that I think can can also still speak about that issue uh, that we have in communities. Um, you know, as as many of you know, like the and, and this is just kind of also on a personal level, right? I I have experiences of being um, stopped by police, and and some of the first things they do is lift up my shirt and see and want to see if I have that that quote unquote uh, tattoo that is affiliated with a gang or even just my city, right? Um, and they asked me about other tattoos that I do have on my bodies that are more um, more viewable, more, um, you know, on view on my body. Um, and, you know, this, this took literally one day, my uh, friends were in the studio hanging out and I brought this idea to them. Um, I always have tape playing around um, and it was something simple that I think I could easily keep doing it. I want to do it on my father because he's he's a very like older Mexican dude, um, you know, mustache and, and he would never have a tattoo uh, on his body ever. So I think this would also kind of point to that, um, that stereotype. Um, and it's, this is also like part of that series that I, I do talk about a lot and I think again I'm always going back to the personal because I think those personal stories really get to that point that you really want to do with your work um, you know for so many years I was avoiding uh, the personal because that brought back a lot of trauma a lot of memories that I did not really want to go back to but I think uh, it was necessary for me to deal uh, with this trauma and as artists sometimes the only way to uh, really kind of heal is, is for me at least is making art um you know again I, I you know talked to some friends that had this similar experience of um of doing this simple gesture that speaks a lot about how to conform to to these kind of like western ideas of uh, of you know being american um and that was always me growing up too right i i remember my mother said, telling me at 12 years old that I tried to stop speaking Spanish. Um, and even though they didn't speak English, um, you know, how I was, how thinking of how I was going to communicate with them without, you know, without trying to speak Spanish because I wanted to be that, you know, I wanted to be more American. I wanted to be more white. Um, and I think that was really uh, traumatic when it came to kind of thinking about identity uh, of myself compared to, you know, what was happening around the world uh, and in, in the U.S. So this is that. Um, and then, um, you know, this is one of my more uh, longer based project called Origins and Displacements. And I think without any of the other work that I have done before, I would not be able to get to this, this, uh, this project because I think everything is uh, interconnected, everything you do is interconnected and it leads to other stories um, afterwards. And I think that's super important, you know, because, um, you know, thinking about how I saw myself in this space, which was, you know, Anaheim, um, at the time growing up, the demographics were changing. Um, 
now it's like 34, I don't know, 54% uh, Latinx and, and feeling a little bit, bit more comfortable now because, you know, I see people that, are, that look like me around me. Um, but also, you know, that I didn't know that there was histories there before me, uh, that there was people struggling as well. Um, and uh, so this, this um, image is called, you know, damn, I can't go on this side of the park. And I have a certain memory of playing soccer here. Uh, I used to practice soccer here twice a week. And, you know, then I found out that uh, not even knowing which side of the park was segregated, but that again, um, you know, we had to deal with these things and thinking about like our place in a, in, in a city, in a, in a county, uh, in a state and seeing sometimes how we have to kind of negotiate like us wanting, us even just living there, right? Um, I think of how things have gone in the past, like this is something that's not new, right? Um, there's something uh, that has happened before and we definitely need to learn and, and kind of uplift these stories that weren't really told. You know, again, I mentioned that I didn't know anything about uh, all these kind of histories that, that were part of my city. Um, you know, I never knew that, you know, mostly brown women were packing the oranges um, and thinking that, you know, on a daily basis, I was drinking, you know, Sunkiss orange juice and that, you know, down the street from where I grew up um, was this history that was there uh, untold and, and, you know, seeing the kind of joy and in, in, um, because of the, the proud work that we're doing in these spaces too. Right, and I think a lot of these um, histories, uh, you know, they have very small information and and I think I try to also like place myself in these situations of like, this is again the park, the same park that was segregated at the time where it would have been um, segregated as well. And thinking, I know where which part of the, the park that is. Uh, and that was a lot of the times where I kind of would hang out in. And, um, you know, along with that, the kind of performance work that I was making with the signage work, I, you know, I still wanted to document on a daily basis, um, going out and, and, and looking at these areas where uh, are so much so near to Disneyland that um, we forget that there's a lot of money that goes into that space, but is it being also kind of spread out throughout the city? Uh, because to be honest, you know, one of some of the most like worst quote unquote violent uh, uh, areas in Anaheim are so are on the other side of the of, of a fence or of a wall that separates Disneyland into um, a predominantly, you know, brown neighborhood. Um, and I think we see again that kind of, um, you know, this connection with uh, tourism and as well with, with the city that, um, and with the folks that work at Disneyland as well in the hotels in the resort area. Um, and particularly, I remember, a, a, you know, an event in 2012 that really affected the city uh, and, and showed those kind of differences, right? Uh, and it was, you know, two back-to-back -back shooting, uh, back -back shootings of, of unarmed Latinx men who were uh, killed by police. And a lot of the protests and riots kind of went out towards Disneyland and, um, you know, over the speakerphone, they were telling the folks uh, to stay within this kind of radius because there was a uh, quote unquote civil unrest um, beyond, uh, beyond the park limits, um, right? And I think uh, thinking of what the tourists would think about when, you know, they were told to stay away from these areas because there was riots going on. So, I mean, for me, that just kind of was, you know, flabbergasting, asking, like thinking of, you know, what were these uh, tourists thinking about or were they just saying like, you know, you know, going on with their day and, and thinking about uh, Magic Mountain. Um, and again, you know, I found things that, um, again, still surprised me, but 
I think it's the point that I, I was um, already knowing that there was this history that just needed to be found. Um, and I included this quote, but I mean, it's, it's, it's a great book that I, I, I teach also to my students. Um, these kind of alternative texts in photography and, and what the archive does. Um, and what, is, what does it mean when you open up an archive, your own personal archive, but as well as city archives, right? Because um, I know, you know, the reason why I ended up finding these archives was just digging through my own archives, uh, you know, then kind of talking to other folks in the city um, and seeing that that these events kind of also lead up to the current events that we're having now and in, 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 in all of what 2020 was. Um, and I think a lot of my, my work also really tries to elevate these small moments in, in, uh, in spaces that you know, are really unseen as well. Um, we don't really, and, and specifically in, in neighborhoods of color, we don't really use, I mean, there's Craigslist, there's all these other uh, apps that you can get like, um, you know, find apartments for rent. Um, but I think this is still really relevant to a neighborhood. It's really, uh, you know, the way uh, people get what they, what they need. Um, Right, and I think I think portraits are really a, a nice way to kind of show who is behind all that, um, all those histories. Right, I think a lot of us still have roots in, in different parts of a, of, uh, of our cities, and um, you know, same thing as use the people that you have near you. You know, these are friends of mine, uh, folks that I meet through through uh, social media, and I ask them some question, which is like, which spot do you like to hang out with with your friends? Um, you know, on, on your way to school or on your way back from school, um, which area do you kind of like? And, and I usually, I photograph with a, a bigger camera, uh, you know, medium format film. So it takes me a while to actually set up a camera and, and take that first image. So there's a lot of discussion, there's a lot of um, conversation uh, because, you know, I, I think you'll get a, a truer portrait uh, with that with those conversations, um, things come up and, and I think uh, they're super important. It, it's su super different than working as a photojournalist, I think, um, which I, I, I was for, for many years. Um, you know, as a photojournalist, sometimes I felt that I was like parachuting into a community, getting what I needed and kind of, you know, coming out. Um, you know, obviously I think uh, photojournalism has changed a little bit. There's try they're also trying to kind of think about the issues with just doing that and, and how do we kind of um, really more center the community that we're coming into. I'm not sure if I saw a question, but I'm trying to. Um, Joe, I'm not sure uh, how many mi more minutes I do have. Um, you're on mute, I believe. Um, how about four more minutes? Perfect. And William, I'm glad you brought that up. <clears throat> um, you guys can start going, using the chat and posing questions. And then I will go ahead and send them to William and read them out, okay? Perfect, perfect. Um, so, I mean, I think uh, I'm, we'll be announcing a, 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 a book uh, that I'll be publishing with a small uh, publishing house uh, that's just going to be solely on origins and displacements. Um, and I include, you know, I think uh, including portrait landscapes and uh, these images where, where I use myself in these spaces where I'm, I'm thinking about, um, you know, I'm this kind of, I'm, again, I'm not showing my face. I'm, I always kind of stay away from that. Um, I, I kind of was more used to never being photographed as a photographer. Um, I think it it scares me a little bit, but I think this is a placeholder for for folks to kind of also step into these areas. Um, so the beginnings of chapters are going to be uh, these images that kind of also correlate with uh, archives of the city um, 
my titles are very kind of explicit as well. You know, I have, um, this is where, um, you know, 1936, and then I also talk about uh, contemporary, um, you know, more recent events that still talk about violence uh, towards uh, communities of color, that if we were violent back in, you know, back in 1924, and then 1936, and then again in 2012 when that, uh, those events happened, are we really learning a lesson from, uh, you know, from, from history or, or are we still going through the same path? Um, you know, I'm always also encouraging students to think about these small moments in their, in their lives. Um, you know, as a photojournalist, I always thought the best image was gonna be that kind of very, climatic moment in in, uh, in an event, you know, the the arm raised, the fist um, closed, the, you know, the kind of explosion of, especially when covering protests, um, I was always looking for these moments and, and they never really did anything to me until I started looking uh, a little more closer, which was, you know, how I was raised and how I was, um, you know, watering the lawn or, 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 you know, the flowers is that these made more connections with other communities that I knew and that folks were also saying, Hey, I also used to do this too. Um, and I think those made way better connections than, than the work I was doing beforehand. Um, again, I'll go through these, uh, pretty fast. Um, you know, again, you know, super personal, uh, backyard haircut. This is my, my father. Um, you know, I can't see him with tattoos and, and I think it'll be funny too. Uh, right. Again, talking about the archive and, and talking about, uh, you know, this, this now is a, uh, a little kind of like area where you get like pretty expensive, like popsicles or, or get some kind of, you know, um, and a boba or whatever. I think it's it's been lost. That history has been lost, and I don't think that gets told often. So, you know, this is um, another place that I'm always thinking about. If, if you know, this was the the area where those women were, you know, packing the oranges, and um, we've totally erased them from from this space. So I think I'll stop there. Let me, All right. Um, one of the first questions I have, first of all, they wanted to thank you. And they also asked, what advice would you give to students as they start to venture out around their home and their community in terms of what to look for? Um, maybe if you could speak a little bit about your process in terms of finding photographs and themes to develop? Because a lot of these kids are gonna start working on independent projects soon. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing I do is actually where I usually start is, is my uh, my backyard. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, I'm not sure how early y'all wake up, but uh, I, sometimes I can wake up early, but those times that are best are like, and um, like, sunrise like an hour after sunrise and then in the afternoon is like an hour before sunset right that golden hour uh, because i think light is also important when you're photographing these um very simple things in, in um, around first your home wherever you grew up and then kind of walking around and seeing what kind of um you know what what catches your eye um again you know i photograph and film so i'm kind of super picky about what I photograph. Uh, but if most of y'all are gonna be working with digital, um, I think you can go, you know, shoot as much as you can and, and see what works. Um, I am, I'm always looking at other photographers as well. Uh, you know, there's photographers out there that are doing amazing work. And, uh, you know, sometimes the most simplest image is, is the most beautiful one as well, um, you know, Again, you can go in closer. I always try to go in closer and see how that works. Uh, use the people around you, uh, your immediate family. Um, 
you know, this my this is not the first time I, I photographed my father and he kind of is so used to it now. Before he wasn't, um, he used to always just be like, all right, hurry up and, and let's go. Uh, but I think now he enjoys, you know, being the subject of a photograph. William, when you said going closer, what do you mean by that? So the image of, uh, of the hand, um, you know, I imagine I, I photographed that like stepping back, right? Um, and I think what, I think it was Robert Kappa that said that like if, you know, take those two steps in and, and I think those images can be a little more interesting. Um, you know, don't be afraid to kind of, uh, I mean, usually it's, it's depending on like if it's a portrait and you want, you know, that environment, but also take one that is up close that as you saw, you can see the kind of like, um, you know, my dad's like mustache or, or these small um, details that really kind of make the image, uh, you know, the plastic black bag that, you know, you can definitely see that he's not, even though I'm not showing the surrounding area, you can see that he's not a, at a, you know, barbershop. Um, what are some of the things that you hope are brought to attention in the future, especially with other artists? Like, I, I'm thinking maybe, what would you find inspiring seeing these guys, the type of work for them to make? I mean, I, I would definitely like if if I see more personal work, like you know, something that's very. I, I know it's, it's it might be a little bit scary sometimes to get into these kind of personal issues, um, but I think you'll you'll find it interesting that some of those uh, more personal stories are the more universal ones. Um, you know, making work now for about ten years. Um, you know, sometimes thinking that I I was that I needed to make work that was more broad, that kind of, you know, I thought that was gonna be speaking to more people, but then realizing that this work was actually the, the most successful work that I've had is, is, you know, some of these images are being shown in New York and I'm thinking like, this is 3000 miles away from, from where I made the work. Um, you know, I think that's very much more important now than, uh, than it is because a lot of the, the work that I do care about is about lived experiences. Um, and I think uh, we need to speak more about those lived experiences. Um, I think this is also kind of interesting considering that we live in a digital age with digital media and that I also thought the same thing. Why have you chosen to use film versus digital? Because we actually have a film class that we teach, film photography as well. Um, and why are those specific facts on your self-portraits on those boards? And I'll leave it to those two questions. Yeah, I mean, film is, um, you know, I, I'm thankful that I, in my education, I started off with film and I think it helped me understand uh, light. Uh, you know, more, I, had, I, had, I put more attention to light when I was photographing and understood like, you know, when was a good time to, to photograph. Um, also film was more expensive and Oh, it's still more expensive, but I always, you know, I didn't have much money. So I was thinking of like, this is it. Like I only have 24 uh, shots on this roll. If I mess up, uh, I have to buy another one. So that means I have to ask my, my mom for, um, you know, for more money. And of course she's going to say no. She says, do better in the, in the, in the next row or else you're done. <laughs> right. And I think it, it kept me on that kind of um, very strict kind of idea of like, okay, I need to make these count. Um, with this work, I even get less um, photographs. I get 10 per roll. Uh, so I think it just puts a lot of, and you know, in the beginning I was shooting every day. Uh, now I'm kind of more uh, specific of, of what I do, but uh, you know, I would start shooting the most you can uh, because it is digital and I think it could give you uh, kind of more insight. Um, and also, what, why did you choose, is that you holding up the board, and why did you choose those messages on the board? Yeah, um, yeah, that is me, and I think, um, you know, I wanted something that was more uh, consumable and also more uh, simple uh, for folks to read. Um, you know, and I think somewhat also a little more confrontational. I also think about my work. I try not to um, 
you know, I'm, I'm very kind of directive with the work and what kind of, you know, what it wants to say, um, at least with the what works with signage. The portraits are a little more open and I think uh, people can kind of, uh, you know, bring in more ideas uh, depending on, on their own personal stories as well. Uh, but the signage work is very particular when it, when it comes to kind of thinking about what kind of direction, what kind of ideas I do want to say with them. Uh, and they work in tangent with the, you know, with the names of, of the, the titles of the, of the works. Um, you know, I think I'm, I'm being a little more strict on people that I, I you know, when I'm thinking where my work is going to be shown, uh, I don't want folks to kind of digress with the issue. Um, so I think that's why I use, you know, one sentence. Also, I'm, I'm trying to fit something a uh, fact into like a 20 by 30 board uh, and it makes it difficult to to read from afar um this is a good one and we run across it all the time what can you do or what do you do when you just don't feel like making work what do you do when for inspiration when you don't feel like doing it um i go on netflix for 12 hours no, just <laughs> no um, i mean i I'm thankful that I have a space where I can kind of think on my own and just, um, I'm a avid collector of, of photo books. And, and I think, uh, you know, I just keep looking at, at work. Um, you know, I would say I, I love books and I think it's still very much a, a great art form of, of producing, uh, of showing photographs in a book. Um, Cause digital isn't really, um, you know, I don't get that kind of connection with, with um, when I'm looking just at the digital, um, the work and the digital space. Um, um, what else do I do? Um, I'm, I mean, I love music. I love podcasts and not, not particularly on photography, but I just kind of listen on other stuff. Uh, I think it's always nice to kind of think about self-care when making personal work, um, you know, there's times in, in the beginning of the pandemic, I wasn't making any work. I was just bummed out and I was, um, you know, I, I go out a lot to check out shows, to go check out music. Um, and then they kind of took me away from the work and, and just kind of looking at myself again, like thinking about the personal. Um, and then I started making more and more work after that. But um, I, I mean, I know that y'all have deadlines and <laughs> they might be difficult to take you know, three weeks off, <laughs> um, but a day or two can, can easily help. And William, um, what do you, what helped you pursue photography after high school? Um, was there anything about your high school experience that helped you move in that direction? Like you can be honest. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of students find resistance to the idea of pursuing something like photography and art after high school. What, what was it for you that you made that decision? Yeah, so I'll be honest, I started college um, doing biology and, um, you know, I think, and I just actually didn't show up to college on the, the you know, the week afterwards. Um, I started doing photography my senior year in high school because I thought it was going to be an easy class. I had senioritis. I'm sure y'all heard of that. Um, you know, I was kind of in this, um, in this space where I was like, ah, photography should be easy. Um, it, it was one of the most difficult classes I took because, you know, you actually had to work with chemicals. Um, you had to think about uh, math and, and I wasn't, uh, you know, junior year and all, I was like a, you know, AP student. Um, so photography wasn't something that I, I thought would, um, would make also my parents like happy because I wanted to be a doctor. Uh, my brother's going to be one. So I think it, that took off a lot of, um, a lot of stress. Um, but there's so much you can do with photography. Um, I've done it all. I've done quinceañeras, weddings, uh, my cousin's baptisms, um, you know, first for like a hundred bucks and then I started doing like a grand or two, right? Um, so advertisement, like products. If, if your friends are, are, you know, creating like a fashion line, like, you know, 
volunteer and be like, I'll, you know, I'll photograph the product on, on people and, and kind of practice there. Um, you know, mostly what I do now is, is uh, show at universities, at galleries, um, I lecture at universities, um, and then um, slowly, you know, these places are also collecting my works. Um, and, and, and I teach as well, right? I think um, that's something super important. I want to definitely change the narrative of photography um, to versus what I like experienced in, in, in my time in education. Um, you know, I didn't really see a lot of people that looked like me in, in uh, you know, in the lectures and the slideshows or even the ideas that I thought, I think thought was important to me. Um, and I think, you know, there's a group of us, um, I'm a millennial, so, you know, I think there's a, a group of us that are really wanting to change that narrative in photography uh, because it is a diverse, um, you know, when I look at my students, it's diverse. And, and I think we don't see that um, in the slideshows that, that we have to teach. And one last question, um, what was it? Sorry, oh, how do you go about, because a lot of the students are gonna, like I said before, begin their own personal projects. And how do you go about doing the research component for your project? An example would be the archival material that you saw of the packing shed workers. Mm -hmm of the women. Yeah, I mean, that, that took a little more, more, more while. like, again, I was, it was pre-pandemic, but, it, you know, I started that work um, at the beginning of my grad, uh, grad school. Um, and it's, I think, I mean, if the library was open, you can easily request to look at some archives. You can, um, you know, now there's like digital archives that you can specifically, you know, look at, at where you live, where you grew up, and and find some cool archives there. Uh, but then again, I think you start again. I started with my own personal archive. Uh, you know, one thing, fun thing to do is just kind of maybe recreate some of those childhood photographs that you do have, and then see how what that takes you. And, and um, you know, I think the hardest thing to do is actually start photographing. Um, you know, that project that you want to do, or you know, I think, but the action of, of photographing uh, would just kind of find, you know, that helps you find the way of like what kind of project you want to do. Um, you know, again, I never really kind of spoke to my parents about like, um, you know, they're coming to the States. Um, you know, this time during the pandemic, I had actually time to sit down and, and record some of those stories um, and think about even I walked from where I currently live to like my elementary school, to my middle school, and then to my high school. And that just kind of brought up memories as well. Um, obviously, y'all are younger. So for me, it was like, you know, bringing back memories from like 15 years ago. <laughs> well, yeah, we went over nine minutes. I just realized. Um, sorry. <laughs> but again, I just wanted to say thank you for giving us this insight into your work, but also that your work is going to be the springboard along with some, a couple of other artists for these projects that we're going to be working.